Good morning. My name is Don Smith. I'm the pastor at Sturge Presbyterian Church in San Mateo. And we're glad that you're joining us for worship this morning. Let's pray. Lord, as we explore the word you have for us and the extent to which you have come to us in Jesus to show us the truth, let it embed itself in our lives and let us take Jesus seriously today and all the days yet to come. In his name we pray. Amen. As we begin our worship this morning, I'm going to talk about the scripture as we go through them rather than wait until after the scripture is read in its entirety. We're reading from Isaiah 42 and from Matthew 16 this morning. And so let me begin. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And I want here for you to think about this. Who is the servant that Isaiah is talking about? Certainly later on when the disciples read from the Old Testament, they recognized these words as applying to Jesus. But when Isaiah wrote the words, who did he have in mind? Most scholars say that the servant is Israel itself, the people of God, that God has pulled together. And that here we have a description of what Israel is expected to be a witness in the world for. Notice that he will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street, which is kind of the opposite of what we do today. If we have some important word, we want to, to spread it. We want to have it in magazines and newspapers and TV and radio. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Even though this servant is imbued with the Spirit of God, he is gentle and is not one to break a reed or quench a burning wick that is very dim. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. This servant has been chosen and has had the spirit of the creator himself put on him to go on. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Think about that, because we will encounter that later this morning. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they bring forth. I tell you of them. And then we come to Matthew 16, to an event that is considered to be central to the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, a theologian by the name of Charles Dodd thought that this particular event was so important, a, 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 a watershed, that the parables Jesus told before it happened were about the kingdom that was near and it was about to come. And that after this event, Dodd said that Jesus' parables changed and they became parables of the kingdom 
that had already come. So whether Charles Dodd was right or wrong, this event is very important. I'll read. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, and notice that he uses the title for himself, Son of Man. And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, Jesus is using a technique that uh, has been used in other places. For example, when Amos uh, gets into the king's um, hunting area, his, his uh, place, and there are other people there, he begins to prophesy against all the peoples around Israel. And uh, people like that. that. That's good to their ear. And as he goes around, he finally comes to Israel, which is the kingdom to the north that the southerners don't really get along with. And he pronounces judgment against them. And again, the people are really happy about that. And then he pronounces judgment against Judah. And the people are angry because now he's criticized his own hometown. Jesus isn't preaching judgment here, but he uses the same technique. He lets the disciples talk about what other people are saying. And then he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And this is that moment when Simon, and I'll call him Simon at this point, Simon answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him. And notice what Jesus says. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. First of all, his name is Simon. And I'm wondering about the son of Jonah, because in John's gospel, Simon's father is identified as John. And while John and Jonah may have some similarities of name, I'm wondering whether Jesus is using Jonah as the Jonah of the Old Testament, because Simon has been through an experience where God has shown him something in the same way that Jonah had to be shown the reality of God much more dramatically, of course, in that parable. But Simon has something in common with the Jonah of the Old Testament. And that is, he has been given a view of Jesus that is very special, more than others might have seen in Jesus. And that that insight is not one that has come from books or from conversation or other places. It has come from God himself. And then he goes on and he says, and I tell you, you are Petra. You are a rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against it. This one sentence has been a very significant controversy within the church for all the centuries that it exists. The Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, and other hierarchical churches have taken it to mean that Jesus is saying that Peter himself, this man whose name was Simon, but Jesus gives him a new name, Rock, is the person upon which the church will be built. And that is the beginning of what we call apostolic succession. That in order for a priest to be truly ordained, he has to be or she has to be ordained in a strict lineup of ordinations that go back directly to Peter. That there cannot be any break in the succession. 
Now, historically, the Roman Catholic Church has had periods where that was difficult, and scholars, historians claim that it doesn't really apply anymore, but the church still defends the idea. Protestant churches look at this differently. And they say that it is not Peter himself that Jesus says is the rock, but it's this insight that God has given him. It is the faith that has come as a result of God's giving Peter an insight into who Jesus is. And that it's that faith, that process of God putting reality into us, that is the rock upon which Christ's church will be built. Also notice that Jesus says the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against it. Gates don't move. So what Jesus is saying here is that the gates that hold all these people who are judged in sin will break down with the power of the gospel. That Satan cannot hold people once the gospel's power is expressed. And that he goes on saying, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That there's this faith, this understanding of who Jesus is provides justification for those who understand the kingdom, who see who Jesus truly is, know what will come into the kingdom and what will not. Now, the last verse is also important. Then he sternly ordered, didn't suggest or request, but he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. That's like the Old Testament reference to the servant not crying out or bringing it to the streets. It's opposite to everything the world teaches us, that if we have something really special to say, we want to get it out on the streets. We want to advertise it. We want to put it in front of people. Why would Jesus order his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah? I, I wish that we were together because this would not be a rhetorical question. I would be asking you what you thought, and we would talk about it. But he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah because he didn't want people coming to him without God showing them who he was. It had to come not through flesh and blood, but it has to come through the working of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's not real. Uh, you remember Jesus saying that in that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, get out of my sight. I never knew you because the, somehow the relationship wasn't real. And so Jesus here is describing the way we need to come to an understanding of who he is. Now the question is, who do you say? Jesus is? What do you see when you read about Jesus' teachings and you look at the, the images that the scriptures give us of what he does and how he touches the lives of people? Now, I, I did some research and I looked at the lives, as far as they're known today, of all the people who started religions throughout history. And I went back to Confucius, and I went back to uh, Zoroaster, and I went to, you know, I looked at the history of um, uh, Baha'i, and, and so on, some, some of the newer religions, and so on. And what really struck me is that all of the major religious leaders have lived out their lives. Uh, it was kind of interesting, Zoroaster died after having a meal, and he told one of his disciples to be sure he would tell the, uh, 
the cook that it wasn't the meal that killed him. He died naturally of other, other things. But that these religious leaders who throughout their lifetimes were respected and honored and given uh, the opportunity to teach and so on, they all lived full lives. Jesus is the only one that his society killed. And what strikes me about that is that it raises the question of whether if Jesus had lived his full life, whether or not the earth would have truly become the kingdom of God. That somehow the world was threatened so much by Jesus more than anybody else that it had to destroy him rather than see his work fulfilled. And that we are still in the process of trying to fulfill that. One of the interesting things is the church is not dead. We haven't posed enough risk to the world for the world to kill us. We may be changing. We may be evolving. The spirit of God may be moving in other places than the church. But the, the gospel is still alive. It's just that the founder was killed before he could do much. The other thing is that Jesus died a suffering servant, as was described in Isaiah. And he didn't die alone. He was crucified in the midst of two other prisoners who were crucified with him, which gave meaning to the title he took for himself many times, Son of Man. Because Son of Man means basically humanity. That when we look at Jesus, we see humanity. And we see the results of the way we live with each other on ourselves, as well as seeing in Jesus, the Son of God, the expression of God in our midst, and what we are meant to be, what we are meant to emulate. And so as we think about this a very important central moment in the life and ministry of Jesus, it's important for us to remember that God is always inviting, that it is God who opens our eyes to the reality of who Jesus is and how Jesus calls us into ministry with him. Thank you, and have a blessed day.